Welcome to another installment of Monday q and I hope you've had a fantastic weekend and you're looking forward to a great week. As always, thank you to everybody who submitted a question for this week's Q&A. It's actually been a fortnight since I've done one of these because I was away in Melbourne last week, did a few ragdoll shows. I was out at the guitar show doing some workshops. I did a vlog about it as well, which you can check out as well. To everybody who came and said hi, either at the shows or at the Melbourne Guitar Show, I will reiterate again, it really means a lot to me to just meet people in the flesh from the other side of the world. You know, Australia's a pretty big country, so it feels like the other side of the world going from Perth all the way over to Melbourne. Anyway, if you've got questions for next week's Q&A, simply put them in the comments section below. If you want to support what I'm doing here on the channel directly, check the video description for a variety of different ways you can do that. And let's get into some questions. Straight into a follow-up question from last week. Why do Fender still make strats with 21 frets? If you read through the comments, there was some great feedback about people who really like 21 fret, kind of traditional strat style guitars, people who prefer 22 frets, people who prefer 24 frets for a variety of different reasons from having the actual frets to where the neck pickup sits. Basically, Fender still make these guitars because people kind of want, whether it's the guitar or whether it's the idea of the guitar being the same as it used to be back in the day, you know, that old original recipe kind of thing. It seems that Fender tend to focus more on the kind of vintage aspect as do brands like Gibson. You even see that kind of trend with companies like PRS where I still think of the ultimate PRS as being a custom 24, but probably my favorite PRS guitars are the 22 fret ones like my SC245, my McCarty or the DGT that I've played as well. So a lot of people talked about how having a 24th fret kind of changes where the neck pickup is. I think some people are gonna like that. Some people are gonna prefer where it sits on other guitars. I've got 24 fret guitars that sound great on the neck pickup. 24 fret guitars that sound terrible on the neck pickup. I don't know how much that is true. I haven't done a scientific comparison, but basically if you want a Fender that doesn't have 21 frets, you know, they're kind of the most common guitar design out there. You can go and buy a Charvel. That's what Fender do with uh, that kind of spec and they own the Charvel brand as well, like I mentioned last week. So, you know, it might not say Fender on the headstock. I don't know how important that is to anybody else. And there's a bunch of other makers out there making fantastic Strat style guitars as well. My favorite Scorpions album. Excellent question. As much as I would love to include an album that say features Michael Schenker or Uli Roth, two of my personal favorite guitar players of all time. For me, it comes down to a shootout between probably three albums. The first one would be Crazy World because it's the first Scorpions album that I ever owned. And I love the way it sounds. I love the songs on there. There's a general kind of great energy on the entire album, even my categories, as you can hear in the background. Uh, the other one would be Blackout. Blackout to me is like the Scorpions just at their kind of best raw rock and roll energy and Love at First Sting would be the other one. It contains one of my favorite ballads of all time on there, Still Loving You. Great album. It's really hard for me to choose between those three. I'd say most Scorpions fans would probably choose like Blackout or Love at First Sting. But for me, I'm actually gonna go with Crazy World. It's the first one that I had. Probably some of my favorite rock guitar tones on there. Uh, Matthias and Rudolf Schenker are just fantastic on there. Klaus Mine sounds great. And there's just, you know, great punchy production on there as well. So I'm gonna go with that one. Uh, Tease Me, Please Me is the song that got me into it. And I know Wind of Change is on there, which was probably, well, was it their biggest hit or, or was it Rock You Like a Hurricane? But I'm gonna go with Crazy World. What's your favorite Scorpions album? Any chance Ragdoll could do a live for YouTube style thing in the future. That's something I'd really like to do. We've actually got a few live in the studio clips that we did right at the start of the COVID pandemic in 2020. You can check those out mostly on my channel, but a lot of the videos are up on the Ragdoll channel. And I actually put up a bunch of footage from our last Melbourne shows on my Patreon. If you want to check those out, it's uh, just camera audio on there, but you kind of get the vibe. It was a really fun gig and it sounds 
pretty decent on the camera, I think. We've also got a few live albums. Uh, there's a Live at Cherry Bar album, and again, there's that Live at Dog Swamp, Live in the Studio style thing that you can check out. The Live at Cherry Bar album, I've put a bunch of video attached to that up on YouTube as well, so you can kind of get your fix, but it might be fun to kind of do something like that where we just, you know, hire out a venue for the day, no audience, you know, go full Pink Floyd live at Pompeii on it. Have I had a chance to play a PRS Silver Sky? I have, uh, pretty briefly, but a few things really stood out. One, the neck felt fantastic. It felt like a great old sort of early 60s Strat, which I have had the pleasure of playing as well. So it feels like they got the neck right. The pickup sounded excellent on there. You know, say what you will about the headstock, but I think they just kind of went out to design a fantastic Strat. You know, they had to put the PRS headstock on it, they put it on backwards and, you know, say what you want about that. But I think, as most people would agree, they're pretty solid Strat style guitars. You know, John Mayer knows what's up when it comes to great Strat tones. I very briefly had a plink around on an SE at the guitar show, like strummed a few chords on it. Felt pretty good as well. I would still like to try a Silver Sky SE at some point and uh, give it a run through in the studio though. My thoughts on Steve Farris one of the most talented guitar players of their generation. If you're not familiar with Steve's work with Mr. Mister, some of the just best 80s tones and parts. It's like very tasteful in the pocket sort of playing. They were a critical part of Mr. Mister. They had a few amazingly big hits in the 80s, of course. And Steve Farris, to me, is kind of like you know, if you think of that melodic pop rock thing that was happening in the 80s, he's like the equivalent of a Mike Campbell to that rootsy 70s Tom Petty thing where Mike Campbell doesn't get a lot of accolades as a flashy guitar player, but they had amazing chops. They had that skill in the studio where they could go in and instantly craft a memorable part. And they were a super solid, well-drilled live guitarist. And I think Steve Farris kind of fits into that category as well. Just, you know, in that realm of, you know, your Huffs and your Lukathers as well, if we're talking about the 80s style things. So yeah, definitely recommend checking out some Mr. Mister, one of my favorite bands. Maybe you can put it there as a guilty pleasure. Uh, not so guilty pleasure for me though. So go and check out some of that stuff and Steve Farris, brilliant guitar player. How did I learn so much about stuff like the Axe Effects or modeling units in general? couple of different ways. One is basically not having a life and spending a lot of time just twisting knobs and listening. The other one is reading manuals and the other one uh, for the fractal stuff is reading the wiki. The wiki is an amazing resource and I would highly recommend any new users check it out because if you go, how do I do that? You can look it up and get a pretty great explanation about it. Shout out to Alex aka Yek for maintaining so much of that. They do an amazing job and I check the wiki fairly regularly and I feel like I learn some new things just about every time I do that. So yeah, lots and lots of hours spent learning and I kind of started doing fractal tutorials and tutorials about modeling units in general so I could you know, learn stuff myself and maybe try to retain some of that information. So the fact that people enjoy the tutorials kind of makes it all feel worthwhile. There's a lot of guitars here as you can probably see. So which one out of this collection do I love but maybe not play as much as I should play? It's probably this guitar, a late 70s, early 80s ES335. It was one of my dad's main gigging guitars when he was gigging back in the day. It's become one of my main recording guitars. This thing just layers so well. You can hear it on just about every ragdoll recording at some point. It's got a little coil tap down here on the bottom horn. It's got the trapeze bridge basically fretless, so I don't play it live for that reason because it is uh, very, very difficult to play, but it sounds amazing. And anytime I play it or just kind of pick it up, it needs to be tuned, but it's got a lovely acoustic tone. I don't know what pickups are in it, but the pickups sound really, really good. Uh, I had it serviced a while ago by one of my mates who did all the hard work of kind of getting the original electronics out and then putting new electronics in. It's just one of those guitars that, you know, whether you believe in mojo or not, I think if you believe in mojo, this guitar has got some big mojo. I'm a mojo agnostic, so I know that it works for what I like to do. I should pull it out for like a sensitive Sundays video or something like that, because it's just that point of difference from 
a Les Paul or an SG or even my PRS. It's got a wonderful attack to it. It's kind of got this airiness to it, this softness that something like a Les Paul doesn't have, but you tune it to drop C, run it through a fuzz pedal, and it can be an absolute beast of a guitar. <laughs> comes from Corey Parsons. I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to do my best to answer it. Do you think the films of the 1970s and 1980s depicting the Victorian era and other time periods through their visual lenses are much more visually stunning than how the films from today depict them? You can almost say a similar thing with, you know, recordings from the 70s and 80s and recordings now. Very good question. I'll answer it in a roundabout way because I was watching a sitcom not too long ago that was filmed in the early 90s, but I was watching it on a HD TV and you know back when I watched this show as a kid on a TV about that big the world felt very real and believable and whether it's because I had more detail on the TV or whether because I'm just older and more jaded and more cynical uh, the kind of setting was less believable it looked more like a bunch of crap on a set than it did you know a house or an apartment or something like that so there's definitely that element where Maybe you get diminishing returns as the quality of recording equipment goes up. Like you're not necessarily going to get a better film just because you're using a better camera. You're not necessarily going to get a better recording just because you're using better gear. You still need good stories and good songs and all those kind of things. So what I find interesting is how much in just kind of media in general at the moment, there is nostalgia for that particular era and how in some cases for good, in some cases maybe for not so good, people are kind of reverting to those techniques, those uh, maybe tropes, those styles that were popular in the 70s and 80s. So yeah, it's kind of like part of a big question around, you know, what we want things to sound like and look like, given that it's so easy to get things that sound and look a particular way, you know, nowadays versus back in the 80s, like, most people now could go out and buy a laptop and an interface and a camera and start a YouTube channel. But if you don't have anything to talk about, then what's the point? Maybe that's a good question I could apply to myself. This one comes from friend of the channel, Freddie Mercado. Freddie asks about the racks that I have behind me. My dad actually made these racks from reclaimed Jarrah. So Jarrah is pretty expensive now. If you want to go down to Bunnings and pick up some Jarrah, uh, it's going to cost you a lot. That Jarrah in there was actually the floorboards in my parents' old house. So he fashioned it out of that. And I bought the kind of rack rails from Penn Elcom. They're just basically big boxes. So if you're good at making a big box, uh, maybe get a material that you're comfortable working with, build a big box, put the rack rails in there, and you can have some sweet looking racks as well. I'll finish today's Q&A by talking very briefly about some of my thoughts about the new Extreme song. People have been asking me about this since it came out, but I didn't want to listen to it until I could sit down and really crank it through my studio monitors. I think it sounds pretty cool. You know, it's, what is it, drop D, drop C sharp or something like that. So it's more the aggressive modern extreme. They still got that extreme funk and groove about them, which I like. And the solo is Nuno at his best. You know, a lot of people talk about uh, in particular guitar players like Tosin Abasi about selective picking, and they forget that Nuno was basically doing selective picking back in the late 80s and early 90s, and you can hear some of those like hit an open string and hammer on from nowhere onto an adjacent open string techniques in there. I would love to maybe learn some of that solo at one third of the speed or something like that. I saw a great channel, Snake Transcriptions, put up a transcription of that if you want to check it out. So. Maybe that will be my project over the next couple of months to try and learn that solo. I'm going to be punishing myself big time. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in again. If you've got questions for next week, put them in the comment section below. And I hope you all have a great week. I'll see you next time.